Well, hello. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Visa National Conference and to our session on local exhaust ventilation. Uh, apologies for the delay. We had a, a couple of technical glitches. Thank you for sticking with us. I'm sure you'll find it was worthwhile sticking around. So thank you. Nice to see you all and welcome. Um, local exhaust ventilation. Well, this is, this, is where, uh, this is the place to come this afternoon if you want to be tested, because we're going to put you through your paces and uh, you can pit yourself against the experts. Um, because this, uh, we are going to be do, uh, putting you through a multiple choice questionnaire, which you should be able to see in your poll panel now. Um, and the idea is to, for us to take us through some of the key issues around this very, very important area. Because local exhaust ventilation is a crucial health and safety area with lots of avoidable mistakes still being made, which cause death and suffering to thousands of workers every year. Um, there are still too many instances of occupational lung diseases, including lung cancer caused by dust, fumes and other airborne contaminants in the workplace. So we need to do better. We feel we need to do better. And so what better than to have a panel of experts from the Institute of Local Exhaust Ventilation Engineers? Uh, the Institute is, is allied to SIPSI and is supported by the Health and Safety Executive. And we're very privileged here to have a, a lineup of chairs and former chairs of the Institute and, um, and they'll be, what we'll do is we'll, we'll have a look at how you're getting on with the test, uh, your multiple choice examination, and uh, then we'll discuss some of those results with, with our panel. Um, although it's a good point to, to mention that uh, BISA and the ILEV uh, have been working together for a long time. We've collaborated very well in the past and produced a vital piece of guidance, TR40, which is the Guide to Good Practice for Local Exhaust Ventilation. And now here's my assistant is bringing me the results of the poll. So we'll be starting to go through those in a second. So good, keep sending your answers in. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, but in the meantime, I'll introduce you to the panel who will be, will be looking at your results. So um, we're, uh, first up, I'd like to introduce Jane Basto, who's a former chair of the Institute. So hello, Jane. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we've also got Dean Greer, who's uh, another stalwart of the Institute. Dean, although uh, apparently you claim to be retired, is that, is that correct? Uh, from Stop. my normal day job, yes. <laughs> your day job, okay. But a former electrical engineer and surveyor, and again, uh, another uh, former chair or current chair of iLevy. And um, Adrian Sims is Managing Director of uh, Ventec. Uh, Adrian, uh, Adrian and Jane and I have worked together before on this kind of thing, so we, we should know what we're doing. So hi, Adrian. Thank you for joining us. Hi, guys. Yes, you're welcome. So um, one, one of the things we talked about before, and we'll, we'll come to after the poll, was that the issue that with the TR40 uh, guidance, uh, you, you guys believe that uh, compliance with that would be a good way for the construction in industry to save thousands of workers every year from succumbing to... Uh, uh, very unpleasant health conditions such as industrial asthma and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and life limiting respiratory conditions. So um, a crucial area and uh, something that we need to test. So let's look at our poll and let's discuss uh, and see how people are doing. Our first question is what is a substance hazardous to health in relation to COSH? Now it's going to be interesting to see. Now I'm going to show the, show the results now, I hope. and. Um, and as you will see, the thing that the one that got the most answers that was all of the above. Now we got nine votes out of it, and so we're talking about over seventy-five percent of our poll was all of the above. So Jane, were they right? Yes. <laughs> short, <laughs> short answer: yes. Um, and I, I would hope that everybody would have got it right. It's a bit disappointing that we're looking at 75% um, only. It's, uh, the other 25%, I'd be interested to know what they said. Yes, well, let's have a quick look, shall we? Um, there were two for, for chemicals and chemical mixtures, uh, so about 15%, and 8% went for dust, fumes, vapours, mists, and gases. So... Yeah. So, so a bit, bit of homework for everybody to do there. It's, so so why is caution important? important? It's important to remember that almost every substance is hazardous to health. And it's about the dose. It's about how much you're exposed to, which makes it more harmful or not. So pretty much everything in, in, in a certain dose is hazardous to health. Okay. It is, and Dean, were you surprised? 
Sorry, carry on, Jane. I was going to say, it's a very common misconception that Kosh is just about chemicals and, and chemical mixtures. Right. I've, I've had that conversation with uh, numerous people over the years who, who think it doesn't apply to them because it's all about chemicals when, uh, you know, as, as Adrian says, it's quite right. Most things are hazardous to health um, and most things in the right dose will, will come under the Kosh regulations. Got you. I mean, Dean, have you think, seen this, uh, people's awareness of Kosh and the issues around it change in, in your time, been in the industry a long time? It's it's certainly improved over the years, but we we know there's a long way to go yet. Uh, I, I get quite a few people who know about dusts and fumes, everything else, uh, they, they think, oh, that doesn't count, especially, as James says, the chemicals and, and chemical mixtures, but everything in uh, the amounts or a certain amount will be hazardous and also for the length of time that you're exposed to them. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. So let's, well, shall we move on to our second question? Um, the second question is, where do I get a safety data sheet for the hazardous substance I am working with? So answers, 60% went for the supplier should provide you with one initially and if there are any changes. Um, we had 30% saying it's down, it should be the, <laughs> the HSE, and uh, you're going to love uh, the 10% who said, what is a safety data sheet? So, so I thought I would amuse you get, on the panel. That, that okay. is a common, common uh, response we get when we ask for safety data sheets. What's that? Mm -hmm. um, okay, right. Yeah, the, the HSE won't give you safety data sheets. They might give you some guidance where to find them, but it should be the suppliers. Uh, the people who are, who are manufacturing or handling that chemical or that substance should be able to provide you with a material safety data sheet or a safety data sheet. Um, and, okay. and again, it, it, it should, they should update it uh, if, if the product changes. The, the thing to remember is safety data sheets as well. When you take a substance and you start working it, you might change its form. So you might buy a liquid, but if you then heat that liquid up, you're getting vapors and coming off of it, that's a different form. So whilst the liquid might be harmless, the vapors could be harmful. So you okay. have to bear the things in. Well, I mean, it might make sense to actually take that with the, with the next question, actually, is what, what can you learn from a, a safety data sheet? Would that make sense? We sort of discuss, discuss around that by looking at the results there. Yeah. Um, uh, you'll be you'll be pleased, of course. Uh, I I knew the answer to this, but that's because you supplied me the answers in advance, and that most <laughs> most people got, got this one right. What can you learn from a safety data sheet? Ninety percent with went with B, which is toxicity, flashpoint, storage guidelines, exposure controls, risk, and hazard phrases. Um, so actually, most almost everybody got that one right. Does that reassure you? Yes, but I'm I'm surprised. So I I think we've got an audience of experts rather than an audience of um, people that are you know not dealing with the topic every day. Because my experience is, and, and you know, every day I'm asking people to see their safety data sheet, or the old term for it was the material safety data sheet, an MSDS. And I would say, and I, I'd ask Adrian too, because he he will have this issue as well. Um, probably at least half the time, people supply me with the wrong kind of sheet. It will be a data sheet about the 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 properties of the product and the way that you're supposed to use it and the you know your manufacturing capabilities with that product but there won't be anything about the risks and the hazards involved um the other yeah, thing i'll add just very quickly is that they they are frequently wrong um mm. and frequently out of date you know people will send yeah. in safety data sheets for the substances they're using and it would have been issued in 1990 and i know full well there have been seven or eight issues since then they've never updated the copy they've got on their files it's really old photocopy i've even had you know old carbon copies sent to me that uh, tells you how old some of them are and the data will be really out of date and sometimes the manufacturer's got the data wrong as well so it's um it's a really difficult Okay. But Jane, I would say, and I put this to the rest of you, I mean, this is, this is a common thing we hear in lots of other parts of the industry, that, that people are using outdated systems mm -hmm. and out, outdated material, and uh, because they've never, I guess, because they've never bothered to update their knowledge. How do, I, I'm pretty sure we discuss this at every national conference. How do we 
tackle that? How do we improve people's um, awareness and encourage them to use the most up-to-date guidance? Dean, can we, what do you think? Sorry, were you asking me, Daniel? Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. just um, trying to start with you. It's, it, it's one of those questions. You can only keep on about it and advise your customers, advise those that you deal with. Um, but it's, it's something that people should uh, look at. They should know that things change, and it's not just in the LEV industry. Uh, lots of guidance changes is, and is reviewed from British standards to SDSs to everything. Um, it's you know, Everybody should be looking out for these things. I know it's a busy world out there, but you've got to keep up to date. And it's especially with substances hazardous to health. If they change, as Adrian has said, if you're using it in a, in a gaseous state or a solid state or a liquid state, you have to have all of those and you have to be up to date and try and keep up to date. Yeah, well, Adrian, I, I mean, we, yep. we've worked together. Biza, Biza and ILEV have worked together. We work with SIPSI, obviously. Do you think this is a is something we need to think about a, a joint campaign, possibly, to, to raise yeah, awareness? Yeah, I, I think there's around a lot of elements, and not just LEV, but the, the wider industry is education. People don't know what they don't know. Um, and if you're not dealing with data sheets, uh, safety data sheets on a regular basis, you won't know if it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, Jane and I and Dean, we, we deal with them every single job. We, we need safety data sheets, so we're seeing them all the time. And we, we, you get to see good stuff and bad stuff. Um, and it's, it's just about asking questions, making sure you get the right information from your suppliers uh, and, and from your customers. So a lot of BESA um, uh, members out there will be installing LEV systems or testing or servicing and maintaining them making sure they're asking their clients, can we have up-to-date safety data sheets, please? And pushing the owners back onto them, who then should be putting it onto their supply chain to make sure they've got the most up-to-date um, documents. Because they do change, they do change over time. Um, and and um, and also different suppliers, You and, and again, Jane and I do very similar jobs, so we, we see the same sort of things. You will get some suppliers who are very, very good, and have good quality data sheets with lots of information. You'd have others which have a standard template sheet with a lot of blanks on it. That's mm -hmm. no good to us. We need to know the information. Um, so, it, you know, the whole uh, saying, you know, you get what you pay for is sometimes very true. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think, um, think this is connected with the next question. If we looked at the results to the next question, I think the um, some of the information we overlaps with that. Yeah. Well, that's very that's interesting because that's where you get the push then, don't you, from the client? Because un, under under question four, we've got whose responsibility is it to do a COSH Regulation Six risk assessment for individual processes? And you were pleased to know that over sixty percent said the duty holder, mm. um, which is yes. the client. Yes, and, and again, then he actually these said the LED designer. <laughs> sorry, 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 Jane. Could you well, Jane first, then you, Dean? I was going to say this, these two, you get very variable quality, but the two things go hand in hand. You were saying, you know, how do people know they've got an out of date data sheet? Well, uh, one of the reasons would be if they were regularly reviewing their risk assessments, which obviously they've got a legal obligation to do, um, they should be regularly reviewing the risk assessments. The risk assessment for the process is going to make reference to the hazards and the risks inherent in the product, which they're going to find out about from the safety data sheet. So the first step when they're reviewing their risk assessment is to get together the, the safety data sheets for the products that are in use and check that they have got the latest version. You know, just have a quick look on the supplier's website. Most suppliers, you can simply go to their website and download the latest safety data sheet. And if not, you can email them and have it emailed back to you. But that's your first step. Then the next step is to check that um, your process is actually what you're describing in that risk assessment. And if people go through that regular review, the, the fact that things have changed in the last 18 months and they do things differently now, that'll all be fresh in their memory and they can revise the, the risk assessment for the process and they'll end up getting 
better LEV that's going to protect the health of people that are working with those substances because they've got all of the right building blocks in place. I mean, I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I, obviously, I'm not an LEV specialist, but it's interesting that people realise it's the client's responsibility. Are clients universally aware of that, that it's their responsibility? No. <laughs> I thought not. Three shaking no, heads. No. We, we often ask for the cost reg six risk assessment and people look at you blank. Um, or, or they do provide you with something and it talks about safety goggles and glasses and footwear and but not about the inhalation risk or the exposure risk. Um, mm. The risk assessment's got to cover all, all risks when doing a process, not just the physical ones, but the, the respiratory ones and the, the other health mm. effects that may come about from using certain substances. It's, it's, rather, it's rather worrying that, is it not? But, I mean, because I mean, these, are, these are people who are taking responsibility for other people's health and well-being and safety. So therefore, you'd feel that they would feel that sense of responsibility. To be you, fair, though, they're taking responsibility for running their business, for paying their taxes, for understanding employment yeah. law, for understanding contract law, for understanding health and safety law. You know, we put a lot on people who run businesses. It's different if you're a conglomerate and you've got departments for everything and you've got a health and safety manager, but um, often SMEs just don't know what they don't know. That's a big issue. That's, that's, that's a great phrase that you and Adrian have both used, which is you don't know what you don't know. And you, you'll, you'll be very much pleasing our CEO, David Fries, because he likes to use that expression too across the sector. People don't know what they don't know. So it's, um, and there's a big education job to do, is there not? It so, is. Shall we look no, at I mean, we, we find just, almost just every day is an, an education day. Yeah. Bonding. Yeah. Well, just a ah, short comment ahead. on that. You don't know what you don't know. It's what we have. It's an unwritten part of uh, the definition of competence. If you look on the, on the HSE website, uh, it's competence is, or it says there, it does not say, or does not add the additional bit. You need, if you've got the competence to know what you don't know, that makes you okay. more competent. Yeah. And, and ask, ask the questions. Mm -hmm. So find out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, let's, um, let's, let's look at our next, uh, our next question. Now this, this actually got some quite variable results. So this question was, does your LEV supplier stroke designer need to see the process the LEV will serve? And if so, when? So the uh, correct answer was actually um, chosen by over 60%. But we did still have uh, 12, 25% going with answer A, only if they are also commissioning the LEV, uh, which is interesting. Is that, does that yes. surprise you? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Yes or no? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't understand. It's a better so that, response that, that, than the other two. <laughs> it's, just, it's just them getting confused about commissioning. So when, so when the, you, when, yeah, it's only a commission when you're your responsibility. When you're designing a system, it's all about understanding the process. What is the process? Mm -hmm. How is it being take, carried out? Who's doing it? Uh, what are they doing? What are they using? So it's it's vital that the designers understand that process. And, and more often than not, you need to see it to, so you understand it in its full detail. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're commissioning the job at the end of, of its installation. As a designer, you need to see it from the outset. Um, yes, there are some routine standard sort of designs which we can go, okay, I've seen that before. We know what we're doing here. Um, but more often than not, and, and I think Jane would agree from a design point of view, we want to see it. We want to see what's happening, what they're doing, because every operative works slightly differently. Um, and yes, we can do some training with them and, and try and encourage them to work in a, a sort of standardized way, but people are people and they don't do that. They, they do what they want to do and how they've always done it. So from a design point of view, we want to see every application at, at the beginning. It might be a video, or it might be a zip, but we want to see it. Well, I mean, One I think thing that's I've interesting. 
It's an interesting point because actually we had um, Professor Catherine Oakes giving the keynote uh, at the start of the conference this morning. And she, she was very much talking about um, that the, the ventilation industry and the building services industry as a whole needs to consider health and well-being aspects for people. Now, I mean, they said, she said mainly in the past we've been sort of focused on um, comfort and energy efficiency. Mm. And now we need to think more about health. And she said that's going to be quite a big change. So that would be something I think that would chime with what you're you're talking about there. Mm. If you don't actually know what the system is doing, you know what impact it's having, then um, then how can you design it properly? Mm. And what and you know what it's there for. So I think it's uh, that's that's a that's a very that's a key point. Yeah. Shall we look at our next question? Um, uh, let's have a look. So our next question. was about, um, okay, so this was very specific. This is about a specific challenge. Um, you install a new woodway system with internal filter plant. Good control is observed at all points and there's no concerns. However, no explosion relief panel is fitted. Do you so that we then get, you then gave us four options and 66% um, went with B. So I'm looking at my answers here. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, okay, so that's so we've got sixty-six percent failing the system. System must comply with Desire. Yeah. It is a legal requirement. So are they are they on the right track there? I disagree. <laughs> I don't think there's enough but information in the system to make a decision. Um, because for a start, we don't know if it's dust or if it's shavings. If it was shavings, what's the problem? Um, because there's no explosion risk. Um, the, the question doesn't ask that. If it's dust, what are the quantities involved? Is this a very small system that doesn't need explosion relief because the, the potential to have a potentially explosive atmosphere within the extraction unit isn't there because there isn't room to develop one. Um, so I think the question needed a bit more information to be able to decide on the right answer. Well, I think Adrian will disagree with me. Yes, no, Adrian. I don't. I don't disagree with. I, I don't disagree with what Jane said. She's, she's perfectly right in that. To have a dust explosion, you need to have a, a dust cloud form, and that takes a certain yeah. volume. Um, so you need a certain size chamber. Um, I, I think with the in the spirit in which the question is written, I, th I think B is the correct answer. Um, mm -hmm. If you've got a, a, a large um, typical filter plant you would see in a woodwork shop, whether it's a school, college, that sort of thing, uh, then you, mm -hmm. you do need to consider the desire uh, explosion risks. If it's a small underbench system, um, which you do see around, they're usually too small to have an explosion, explosive cloud within the within the vessel. Mm -hmm. So if it's a, if it's a large unit, you will get an explosion cloud potentially form when it cleans down. So therefore, you do need that explosion um, relief, and you also need the non-return damper to stop any explosion coming back down the ducting into the into the space into the room. Um, so I think the answer, and glad to see sixty six percent got B, and I do agree with Jane. So uh, it. it yeah. The question could be big, uh, you know, could be worded better, more specific. I think too that there are intermediate-sized units, uh, which wouldn't just be the simple underbench unit where you don't need an explosion panel as well. Um, there's a document called Woodworking Information Sheet 32, produced by the Health and Safety Executive, which is about safe collection of wood waste, and this is one of the reasons. Um, why it's important that the, the company that you're dealing with for your LEV has um, a clear understanding of the specific industry that you're in, because there are specific rules around wood waste extraction, and there are a number of small to medium sized extraction systems where it's perfectly acceptable to simply have an open top on the unit, provided it's above head height, but there are restrictions on um, the total dirty waste volume size of the unit. I actually, I, I spend a lot of time answering queries from people who've had LEV reports done by other organisations where they've said, oh, we failed it because there's no explosion relief on it. 
um, and you have a look at it and you think, well, well, why did they need explosion relief on it? You know, some, sometimes people express um, competence in something when they don't fully understand, you know, the, the range of different things involved. Um, it isn't okay. it isn't straightforward, but if there is there is dust and there is room for a, um, an explosive cloud to be developed, then you do need explosion relief. And in a situation like that, I would fail the system. But I see a lot of okay, systems well, failed to be. All right, Jane. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, I think that's um, that's that's a very specific issue, but a really good example of the sort of thing we're talking mm -hmm. about and how people people have to have um, up to date knowledge. And they also have to have competence. So I think it'd be good as we're coming towards the end of our time to, to focus on our two final questions, which are broader questions. And this next one is about uh, competence. And um, you'll, this one was about how can an LEV professional demonstrate their competence? And I think you'll be pleased to see that, uh, that um, well, actually, 100% with, went with C. Um, I, according to yeah. my crew sheet, that could not be the right answer. Is that right, panel? Mm -hmm. That hold skills card in LEV is not you the can get that, skills. You can get <laughs> yeah, you just tick a box. No one checks your competency to get that. Right, box. interesting. So it's a trick question. Yeah. Yeah, Cowboys are yeah. us. Just tick that box. Yeah. Right. So nobody's checking. And the, I think bees have withdrawn the skills card for LEV. Yeah. yeah they right. should. So I think so. It, so yeah. So what do we do? What 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 what, I think, what needs I think to be done? This this is a good one for Dean because Dean heads yeah. up the competency committee for iLevy. So uh... Dean, what what needs to be done? Well, the one of the ways and um, the one the one way that we look at because we are the Institute of LEV Engineers is the iLevy competency card. Um, it could be argued there are other ways. The HSC will say there are other ways, but they have to. Uh, we believe in the ILEV competency card, which um, does check competency in the roles that uh, LEV service uh, service people uh, actually go about their job, whether they're designers, installers, um, commissioner, commissioning uh, engineers, or thorough examination and test engineers. And we would look at the role that they do and we ask for various experience um, reports, example reports that they do, qualifications should they have it, uh, and a whole raft of other information to ensure that com they are competent in the role that they carry out. And also, the, the, the biggest one is, I and mean, you can have all of the, um, the various qualifications that have been out there and still are out there, if you don't have the experience, then um, I, I, I will pick on, not pick on, but I will quote, say the P601 course. Great course, but you can't just go and sit the P601 and then next week go out and start testing LEV uh, and be competent because you need the experience that goes with it. That's just an example. So yeah, if somebody holds the LEV competency card, and has the um, competence for the role that they carry out and they show you that, you could be assured that they have gone through a robust, robust uh, competency assessment. So, so that's something we need to promote. And that's something maybe, you know, we're looking at takeaways from this conference. That's something for us to, to take away and, and work with and promote. So um, Absolutely, can, yes. can, I, can I just yeah, add sure. to that, please, Ewan? In that the, the competency card at iLeaview, it's... Um, it, it, it's built around the uh, indus LEV Industry Forum competency matrix. So the LEV Industry Forum is a completely yep. separate body set up by the HSE, which bees are a part of, and the BOHS and Sharpa and various other organisations, and iLEV are a part of as well. That developed the LEV competency matrix, um, which looks at the various job roles within the LEV industry, who needs to know what and where they can get that information from. And, and that's where iLEV have built their competency card from that gotcha. forum. Patrick. All right, well, well, thank you guys. We are actually out of time, but I, do want, I don't want to go without uh, addressing the final, final question, which is um, uh, the important one about if you're working on a project that involves LEV, where do you go to for advice? 60% said 
said uh, TR40, TR40, which I mentioned in my introduction. Um, uh, but 30% said the HSE document, HSG258, and, uh, and about 10% went with another visa document, which is DW144. So um, how do you, as a sort of final talk about going to the right place for advice and to get the right guidance, um, perhaps I could just go around each of you in turn and get a, get a last thought on that. So Jane, starting with you. Uh, well, DW144 is a, is a ducting standard. Um, used to be the HVCA duct, duct work manufacturing yes. and installation standard. So yes, it's good. It gives you relevant information about your uh, duct work manufacturing and installation process. It's not going to tell you anything at all about the design process. I can't tell you how many thousands of air conditioning type ductwork installations I have seen over the years, which would probably perfectly comply with DW144, but are totally useless for the purposes of LEV. Um, and I think the other answers are, are correct. You know, I would say all of those documents have some relevance. Okay, thank you. Adrian, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, they, they definitely all have relevance. Um, and we do work to DW144 standards, mm. but it, it doesn't do anything on LEV. Um, TR40 looks at best practice and how to structure the potential contract, how to look for competency in, in the supply chain. Um, and, and then HSG258 is aimed at more the LEV industry itself on what good looks like, what good practice is and what um how how we we, we ensure um systems work okay and, and dean the final word is yours the contracting one. okay and, and dean the, Sorry, the final word is yours. final word uh, yeah it depends on who's looking um because adrian has quite rightly said if you're looking from within the lev industry hsg 258 and tr40 if you're um an end user, uh, somebody who's looking to find uh, somebody to supply and design an LEV system, you'd probably be looking as much at TR40 as anything else. They're all relevant, but it depends on what you know about LEV and what and what you what you're actually after. That's great. Well, th well, well, thank you all very much. I'm, we've, we've overrun a little bit, but um, uh, I think we deserved it. We were a little bit, we were a little bit behind when we started. I think you've c covered an amazing amount of ground there, and thank you for all your hard work and putting all that, all that, uh, the, the, the questionnaire together and putting everybody through their multiple skills uh, examinations. So, um, and thank you very much. We're having we have a session coming up shortly on buildings as safe havens, which is slightly different, but again. Uh, Another branch of the ventilation industry, and um, very, very relevant to that. So, so do join us for that, everybody else. But, uh, but uh, just a, a big thank you to Jane, to Adrian, and Dean. Thank you very much for your for your expert input and for putting the questionnaire together. And thank you to our delegates. You did pretty well, I would say overall. The scores are pretty good. So you know, you know your you know your LEV, and you were pitted against the experts. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, Thank we'll you. See you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.